This week, three sides of the coin. Man, do we get some minutia about Ace Fraley. Never heard before. We find out what the president of Atlantic Records thought about Ace's performance at Madison Square Garden opening for Iron Maiden. And we do a it wasn't lot a horse's of... head. <laughs> <laughs> we, we dig deep into the metal world this week. Johnny Z from Megaforce Records. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. I'm one of the, well, right now two co-hosts. We'll have a third later. Michael Branville, joined by Mark Cicchini. Tommy Woo-hoo. Summers will be with us Ooh. in a little bit. He's not here right Who's now. This is Tommy Summers. What's his okay. name? Ed. 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 Ed Summers. Ed Summers. Um, so I kind of hinted about it last week on on Facebook of the guest that we're talking to this week is going to be Mega. And I posted a photo of our guest with members of Anthrax and Metallica. Some interesting guesses of who we were going to have on. I mean, there was people like, are you going to have Megadeth on? Is Dave Ellison on? Is Lars Ulrich on? A couple of you guessed it right. We are joined this week, and God, this is beyond cool. We're joined by Johnny Z from Megaforce Records. John Zazula. Dude. I, I suggest if you don't know his history, hit the pause button right now. Go jump on Wiki or whatever and just do a little background search on Megaforce Records. This label, I, I mentioned it, I'll mention it in the interview. It, I see it as sort of like it, they were the new wave of American heavy metal. They were the stuff they were releasing, phenomenal. Just amazing artists they were bringing out. Oh, a little band called Metallica. Another little band called Anthrax. How about a band called Manowar? Overkill. Testament. Testament. Oh, and a guy by the name of Ace Fraley. Oh, yeah, there's some Ace Fraley talk here. uh... We definitely have some Kiss-related talk. And trust me, there's a couple really cool tidbits and laughs like what did ace order for dinner at a very fancy restaurant and, and the don corleone of uh, of music Amit um gives at, it. Amit from atlantic records what did he think mm-hmm. of ace after ace's performance at madison square garden opening for iron maiden something that that johnny z himself goes i don't think i even told ace this happened so matter of fact he said ace is going to hear it for the first, first time. time right here just when you guys hear it it's right when ace is hearing it for the yep. first time think about that so anyway this is a fantastic interview it's got some kiss it's got some ace fraley uh but it's a lot of metal just a lot of metal talk here and mark goes fanboy i think i even went a little fanboy myself in this interview because it was just an honor to speak with Johnny. I, you know, I, at least for I can speak for you. We know Johnny's place in metal history, and it is literally right there at the top of the mountain. Well, like I said to him, Johnny, you made the '80s bearable. Yep. I didn't want to listen to fucking Bon Jovi. I wanted to listen to Metallica and fucking Testament. <laughs> and what would you? What God would you, Mark? Mark, what would you? So we're kind of skipping ahead here. What would you have thought if Megaforce had released the Poison album? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Well, look at the timeline. (laughs) (laughs) All right, guys. You got to let this one roll. Johnny Z from Megaforce Records on Three Sides of the Coin. Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and Shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. Uh, 
I don't, I don't know what to say, Three Sides listeners. This is our huge honor. We are joined, and, and I think the word legend is appropriate here. Yes, a Amen. heavy metal music business, music industry legend. We're joined by John Zazula, otherwise known as Johnny Z, from Megaforce Records. Thank you, Johnny. Thank, you. Thank you for making the '80s tolerable. <laughs> <laughs> it was rough for me. <laughs> so, so, so. Obviously, we're a a Kiss themed podcast, and we'll get into your your Kiss connection in a few minutes here. But we do have to we have to talk a little bit about the Megaforce history in the background here. I mean, as as I showed earlier, everybody, this this was released on Megaforce Records, and I, you know this started a revolution. The label started a revolution. The music. Um, Take us back to that first moment, and what would what do you recall the first thing you felt or remembered when you heard Metallica for the first time? Well, I've I've said it many times. It hit me like a hammer, goddamn, you know, out of uh, Thin Lizzy that was quoted. But uh, I put it on. I knew right away it was the answer to for America for some kind of competition with the European metal that was coming and was unstoppable. You know, uh, we had, they had the Iron Maiden, they had Motorhead, they had Angel Witch, they had Raven, they had Venom, they had everything going over there. Even the French bands were amazing in Europe. We had nothing going on here. Yeah, the best we had, I think, were Riot, The Rods, and Y&T. Yeah, yeah, I would say back then that's probably about right. That was it, and you had Twisted Sisters first getting into originals, and 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 because this is a Kiss theme podcast, we had Kiss that was just disintegrating, and like, what the hell were these heavy metal demons releasing this freaking unmasked and, and and Elder and yeah, it was like we needed music, real music, to come in and save us again. Well, that was our intention. You know, we figured if we love Metallica, other people would love Metallica. And that's how we judged our A&Ring. You know, we basically signed bands we loved. We loved Man of War. We signed Man of War. We loved Merciful Fate. We put out Merciful Fate. Anthrax, eventually we got to love. <laughs> eventually. <laughs> Became part of Megaforce. Testament I didn't want to sign. But I fell in love with them when they got Chuck Billy in the band. Mm-hmm. Um, Overkill, you know, and of course, King's X and Ace Freely. Yep. You know, that was a wonderful time when we had Ace. Well, so so on the Ace Freely topic, yes, everybody, if you're a Kiss fan, you ought to know that Ace's first solo album, Post Kiss, as Fraley's Comet was released on Megaforce Records back in 1987. 87. Um, 87. Now we we've had Eddie Trunk on the show a couple times. We all know he's a he's a huge lifelong Kiss fan, and he's had his battles with Kiss of recent. But he talked about how you weren't a fan of Kiss. You weren't really a fan of even signing Ace, and he really had to kind of talk you into it. Well. I was a fan of signing Ace, as long as Ace was in a good place, and his head was straight, and he was focused, and he was able to function. That's what I was only worried about with Ace. Uh, As far as Kiss goes, they were like, sort of like Mulan to me, or Frozen to me. They were like a heavy metal Disney production. I happened to love Christine 16, even though I was listening to Gary Moore and all kinds of other more technical metal. Yep. And you can't say anything bad about Detroit Rock City and all the songs that did on Kiss Alive, too. I mean, Love Gun, everything that you, they, you know, I really appreciate them now. You know, there's that album, I think it's called Kiss, is it called Kiss Legends? It was an import. They do oh, killers. killers. Kiss Killers? 
There's killers. I had that record in my store. I sold hundreds of them. You know, nowhere to run. Yep. Yeah, that was the that was the import. It was, uh, you know, that took America by surprise. Uh, you know, we because because it was you know at the time none of that was advertised. I remember walking into stores like yours. I'm from Detroit. Walking in stores like yours, independent stores, and going, "Holy crap! What's this?" I mean, because it, there was no. So yeah, it was a it was a big deal. It was a big deal, and cover to cover, even though there's songs that we know about, you know, Detroit Rock City. I remember was on it live. They remixed and mastered those songs, and they really sounded really great. Um, but anyway, I just brought that up. Being that you're so kissified. <laughs> well, so so I mean, uh, other other than other than your concern about Ace's, let's be honest, was he clean and sober? That's what it comes down to because we know what he was coming but out of. He was in great, great shape. We we joked about the DeLorean going the wrong way down the street and. He told all kinds of great stories to the press. He was fantastic for the press, and he worked well with them. Plus, his first album, I think that's a perfect Ace Frehley album. I've been told that times, that it's a good Ace Frehley album. And the greatest story about Ace was that when we went to have a mind meld and get serious, I invited him to a very chic and fancy restaurant. You know, a Chateaubriand kind of place yep. and beyond. And Ace is sitting at the table. And the waiter comes over with the cloth over his arms. And he gets his orders from everybody. And he goes, and you, sir, what would you like? And Ace goes, do you have any tuna fish? Uh, could you put it between two slices of bread and bring it over to me? And the, the waiter, like, dumbfounded. And he goes, sir. Do you mean a tuna fish sandwich? And <laughs> that'll do. That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and we walked into the restaurant. It was across the street from Warner Brothers. Everybody was going, Paul, how are you? Paul, how are you? Paul, how are you? Paul, how are you? It was great. I thought he paid all those people five bucks before we went just to say that to him. Oh, Paul, how are you? But uh, he ordered a tuna fish sandwich, that bastard. Uh, <laughs> he did such great Megaforce logos for me on his computer. I have them somewhere. He did me about 50 different logos. He wanted me to change my logo for him for his album, you know, and make it a really Megaforce, which I told him ain't going to happen, you know. <laughs> but it was nice of him to make me 50 different logos. And uh, I had, someone took it from me, I had his Comet pin. Mm. Fault in the silver circle around it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had that with me for a long time. I think somebody during a garage sale helped themselves out to it. <laughs> oh. I really wanted that to stay with me. So, so Johnny, back then, uh, why do you think it took Ace so long to finally land a record deal and get a solo album out? I know the truth. Nobody would ask him. Really? Nobody thought to sign Ace Freely. How did Megaforce sign Ace Freely? Atlantic Records could have signed Ace Freely. CBS, Epic, Warner Brothers, all millions and millions of dollars. And Megaforce goes up to Ace and goes, come on, let's do something. Now, I had a good budget for Ace Records. I mean, I had big bucks in those days. But he could have been signed by anybody, and everybody was afraid of him and this and that. And I realized he was in great shape, and I said, come on, man, let's do this. You know what? Well, all the little bands had lawyers that drove me crazy and nitpicked and this and that and that and that. Here's Ace Frehley. His lawyer just sent me back the contract sign. Wow. Interesting. Of course, if you have a relationship with a band, you'll do things in favor of the band. Right. But there are things there if things go sideways. 
And even though things did go sideways by the second album a little bit, you know, I hung out and did the third. Yeah, the Trouble Walking. Trouble Walking. And I, I love that. Love that record. I took Ace to England. I sort of like temporarily managed, temporarily managed Ace. And I took him, I went before him, I did all the press for him. So when he got there, it was huge. And there was a place called the Hammersmith Odeon. Yep. Mm -hmm. And Ace went on there with this little banner that said, Privy's Comet. And that was the biggest mistake he made because people wanted him to come out like, wow, you know, the Space Ace man. He sold out the place, but they thought it was a, a little show. People really wanted a big Ace Frilly show. And uh, it was a brilliant show, but it didn't captivate the audience the way I wanted. It was a dull audience. Hmm. So that was not a successful show to me at all. But he did. we did take him over there. He did sell it out. That's over 3,000 seats. And I think he had lousy support. I don't remember who it was. Oh, opening act, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, now, Johnny, I, I wanted to know, because before A signed, Richie Scarlett was in the band. How did how how did that transact? Did when you first were when Ace came on your radar, was it the band that that recorded the album that you first encountered or were there member changes from the time you got involved with Ace by the time the record was was released? Well, Do you remember? I remember there was something between Richie and Ace at the moment. And they wanted a singer guitarist. That's why Todd Howard was brought into the band. John Reagan, the bass player, John basically put the band together with Ace. You know, he, he went and got the drummer from the David Letterman show. You know, we had uh, just good players. They were really good players up there. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I would have liked it better with Richie Scarlett. That's how I always felt from day one. I'll be yeah. perfect. That's why I wanted to know that because I was really into like Kick Ass Monthly and you know right. all the old fan scenes and and you know the first pictures I saw of Ace Unmasked were with Richie and the first demos I collected because I was really into that were with yeah. Richie and I was like when the record came out I'm like where's Richie you know what I mean I thought I thought Richie gave it more of a rock and roll cred sort of feeling. He's my Ron Wood of Ace Freely Band. Yes, that is great, great. <laughs> I'm not so I, I didn't know what kind, you know, why, I didn't know, you know, being that, you know, it was for Megaforce, I didn't know if you were part of that. Or I've always wanted to know that. Was that a label decision to bring in Todd? Not at all. Ed Trump ran the ship on this. And Ed did not tell Richie not to come. I believe he wanted Richie to come. I think there was a rift that was happening at that time. And that's the only reason. Because you know as well as I do, you know, Richie's a phenomenal musician. I mean, have you ever seen him play, I mean, like keyboards and... Yeah. Uh, we were in Asbury Park. And I got to see Richie Scarlett. And uh, it was great. He did Bex Bolero. <laughs> wow. He did a great job on it, and uh, that's what I took out of the night with me, that it was very good rocking stuff, good hard rock. But uh, once again, to answer you, I had absolutely zero to do with Richie not playing on the album and would have loved it. So you, 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 pretty, you said this was pretty much Ed's show. He ran it, so you kind of put everything in... Ed's control when it came to putting together this album and release? Well, I sit and watch the studio and make sure what's coming out of the studio is an album that I want. I'm very involved in the songwriting. You know, I was very involved in getting the song Into the Night. 
you know, were written by the same fellow who wrote New York Groove. Mm-hmm. Russ Ballard. Russ Ballard, right. And we went to Russ to get that song. And uh, there were a lot of songs that didn't make the album. And most of them did that he came forward with because he did have 10, 11 good songs to do this. Forgive me, I keep on coming over here because I keep on getting messages. And <laughs> No, that's okay. Um, so what more can I tell you about Ace? Well, so 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 let me ask you. You you said you were involved in the songwriting and over like right. to s- oversee well, that, um, and you you saw it out into the night. Did you have to seek that out because the songs Ace himself was writing and bringing in weren't strong enough in your opinion that you needed outside writers? Well, we wanted to do a ballad song. From the very second we got together, we wanted to do another one. And it was just like a magic thing where he had the song that he had. I thought it was a great song, by the way. Me too. And really classy, man. That's a classic song. And uh, I don't know what to tell you. It wasn't that it wasn't that strong. I felt the first album had strong enough songs. I wish it was a little stronger. But it was good enough to sell 470,000 records out of the box, you know? That had to been that had to have been great for you, you know, because you take someone that you're not sure about, you well, feel I, good about it. Ace, I knew that when when I, I had this album, it was going to sell. I didn't know how much. I was thrilled. But when then we had, I put all this marketing behind Ace for the race for Ace mm-hmm. with Atlantic Records and we had distribution and let's go gold, let's go gold, and as we keep kept on fighting and fighting and fighting. The records kept on coming back. They really overshifted. So instead of having half a million, we had 430, you know? But they really did. They they reached everybody they could. And I felt it was a mistake to put out the live, was it called? Live, live? Plus, live plus one. Because it trains people not to have to buy a record. If you, I think once you buy a shitty record from a band, it's over to a great degree. Unless they come back with something really, really strong that you forgive them from it. And I, I don't think Ace came back strong enough for me to really make it happen. And that's why we had problems uh, well, with the record. I, I felt that way about Second Sighting. I've never warmed to that album, even to this day. Um, it just... It's just, I don't know. It, it just, it, there's no balls to it. I mean, I like like insane. I thought that was a cool song, but That's it was safe. like that was. Other than that, it, there's it's really kind of a non-event record. I. Well, and, and this is coming from a diehard Kiss fan. I was very disappointed with that. Yeah, I was disappointed too because that that stuff wasn't written by Ace. Really. It was, obvious. you know, a lot of Todd on whatever. But I, but I thought, much like Tommy said earlier, I love Trouble Walking. I mean, I love that record, Start to Fish. I'll, I'll tell you the truth, John. I think that album's stronger than the first record. I, I like Trouble Walking a lot. Me too. Rock Soldiers? Well, Rock Soldiers, yeah. That's a, I, I'm just saying overall, though. I think Trouble Walking, Start to Finish, is a better rocking album. Yes, I absolutely love Rock Soldiers. I think any record is pretty much better than Second Sighting. <laughs> 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 yes. It just um, felt like it had no direction, and I don't know. It, well, so sort of what was going on at that point in time, too, was Fraley's Comet was becoming just Ace Fraley. What what, what, what brought that about? Why, why didn't you just release his first album as Ace Fraley? Why did it become Fraley's Comet, and then what caused it to disappear and become Ace Fraley? What happened with Fraley's Comet? album is that the band wanted to be more than sidemen they wanted to be a band and they wanted to be treated like band members with a share in a band not just pay me to do a track pay me to do a track pay me to tour and ace didn't have money and i didn't have money just to pay for gunmen to go out and play with them 
So basically, we took all the money, uh, we made the album, and what's the question again? So <laughs> wh wh why? So the answer to part of the question is, you didn't call it an Ace Fraley album initially because <laughs> the band members wanted to be a band album. It was a band album. But then, Ace what what caused it to change? later on when Fraley's Comet disappeared and now you're just releasing Ace Fraley you know you're asking me things that I may not remember to <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fair all I could tell you is that things started falling apart in the band or between the label and Ace well the label and Ace disappeared because we had nothing to talk about anymore there wasn't a fight. There wasn't a shakeup. There wasn't an Ace yelling at me or me yelling at Ace. We were very appreciative of what we tried to do, but we both knew what we were facing and called it quits at Megaforce. Also, Atlantic Records wasn't keen on doing another Ace album because the budgets were very high. Remember, Megaforce was part of Atlantic Records in right. those days. Yeah. Um, Ace did most of the interviews Ace is what the people wanted to see Ace knew it and it became Ace that's yeah. all I can but that makes sense he was the highlight of the group obviously and the group pretty much screwed things up on that second side you know they wanted to put out an album no matter what. Ace, you know, kissed it, you know, blessed it, and came out not so great. So do you, do you think Ace's heart wasn't even into that second album? I don't know where Ace's heart was at. I think he was definitely into the second album. I, I think that he was starting to fade. He was starting to fade back. Well, I, I think a part of that, though, is is Ace was used to being part of a unit, and now he's the sole focus. And I honestly, especially after the first record, I, I don't think he fully absorbed what kind of responsibility that is. Because Second Sighting is a very Ace Light, L-I-T-E, Ace Light record. I mean, it especially if you compare that to the next to Trouble Walking. Tr Trouble Walking is wall-to-wall -wall ace. You know, Shot Full of Rock is about as quintessential ace freely rock and roll. And and that's how come, again, you know, Shot Full of Rock is so much more in tune with something like Rock Soldiers or something like Rip It Out. I mean, it's got that, you know, vibe, that ace freely vibe. And you know, like I said, with the exception of maybe insane, the second record doesn't. Again, you bought an Ace Frehley record, but I remember the first time I went through it, I'm like, "Where's Ace?" Well, you have to realize that that record sold about 125 thousand. Wow, a long way down from 470. And now, now, go. Let's go back to that a bit, John. I always thought the first record went gold. I could have swore I saw that it, it did. It, it didn't. Well, it never made it. Really. <laughs> gold now you know it may be gold now but I'm not there anymore yeah because I, I could have swore that the first one I thought it was celebrated and I even remember Ace at the time saying you know have you know and this is before second sighting in interviews that you know the first record has gone gold and but well, it didn't yeah, but but Mark let's remember Ace was used to his his 1978 solo album shipping platinum as well <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and getting returned gold <laughs> <laughs> he's been around gene simmons a long time so he knows how to hype and over promote <laughs> whatever the story is you got the truth right here that's exactly and that's why you're here that's why you're here. that had to be quite a shock for megaforce and atlantic to see the not just little drop in sales, but that's a significant drop in sales. Well, what really, really hurt us was I got Ace Frehley and the Comet on some Iron Maiden dates. Yep. 
and he played Madison Square Garden in New York. And I'm in it again, the real boss of Atlantic, the yep. man who was responsible, mm-hmm. came to the show. And we had a big party afterwards at the tunnel in New York. It was a real high profile party. Everybody was there. It was really great. But Ahmed got there early, put his hand on my hand, and goes, Johnny, tell me, it wasn't that good. Mm. And I didn't know what to say because the truth is, I've seen the band a lot better. And against Iron Maiden, they just seemed like an opening band. It really hurt our momentum very much with Atlantic Records when Armand Erdogan lost touch of, and faith in me and the project. And he basically wanted me to roll up the stairs. Wow, I've never heard that story yeah, before. Never that heard that. Amazing. Now, for for the for the younger fans, and uh, Johnny, we have to do this all the time. Ahmet was the Lord God King of record uh, companies. Record. Yeah, he, he, the original record man. Yep. Yes. So yeah. if he did that to Johnny, that spoke volumes. So if you don't know who Ahmet is, that that that's like. Uh, the Lord God coming down and telling you, you, you got to get rid of this guy. When he speaks, there's a huge echo in the room. Yes. Everybody listens. Wow. Yeah. Did, 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 now, did you relate that to Ace at all, Johnny? No. He's hearing it now for the first time. Yeah, I was he is. Say. Wow. Wow. Well, I didn't dig it. And I thought it would really bring Ace up a lot to open up Maiden. Sure. sure. I saw that. It's nice. demographic. I remember just it, it wasn't a good night. And uh, they tried hard, but they didn't pull it off. Well, Johnny, can I have you speculate for just a moment? Do you believe that if they would have been on fire that night, it would have been different? Ahmed would have come to me and says, Johnny, what are we going to do? Not Johnny, you know, patting my hand. This is what I'm going to do. <laughs> uh, basically, he said, if you know, if you want to put out more, put out more. But I didn't feel the fire. And Trouble Walking told even less. Yeah. Wow, well, I mean, it's such a better, maybe, if I, again, you know, just as a rock music fan, the, again, Second Sighting was tough to digest. But your know, trouble walking was so much better. But maybe just a lot of people yes. checked out by then. But to but to to his point earlier, Johnny, um, you said that you believe that sometimes when a record comes out that's not very good, that's all it takes to to kill the momentum of an artist. It, killed it, it was killed with Live Plus One. More so than than Second Sighting. Oh yeah. I so then, that. why did Live? So why did Live Plus One come out then? Was this against what you wanted to do? Oh, what I wanted to do was keep the buzz on Ace going while he was touring. That was basically the, That's the way Iron Maiden worked too. Early on, they pumped these singles out to keep the interest high. So were you kind of using that same philosophy? Yes, I was. By the way, uh, it would have been better as. It was singles, by the way. It's over mm-hmm. with a single, and I think Trouble Walking was a single. And I don't. I, I would argue that Words Are Not Enough is one of his best songs. Oh. That should have been a hit. Great song. Do you think that you were getting uh, pushback from uh, stations that didn't want to give him airplay? I have to say this to you. We had a lot of trouble with the album on the radio. Well, we had a very good radio album with the first album. Yes. I mean, just, they were just tired of it. They didn't want to know about it. They wanted something fresh. You know, that was a, a big thing, too, at the time. There was a, they didn't honor the veterans. Everybody was going on to the new. Like today, the veterans rule the world. The old time was a back right. 60 years old kicking ass but they weren't that wonderful to ace 
They weren't that wonderful to Ace. Ace right now, thank God he's touring again. Yeah. You know? Uh, I saw he's playing uh, up by my old area at the Chance in Poughkeepsie. You know? He, well, Ace has to tour now. I mean, he's not, he's not like he's selling product. I mean, if he... I, I, really, I, that's... I'm very... I'm very detached from what's going on now in all, all these bands. The only band I really follow closely, believe it or not, is Testament because Chuck Billy and I from Testament are the dearest of friends. I loved his uh, his forward too, by because I'm a big Testament fan as well. I loved his forward in your book. I thought that was really, really well written. And him to do that. I have the audio version of it, which is beautiful. I have not, I have not finished the audio file. Um, I'm just real bad at reading. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you, you know, your, 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 your crew sent us all the first chapter and I ripped right through that and I'm like, Oh my God, I cannot wait to read. Yeah. I've got it on pre-order. You can't put down the book. I'm not saying it cause I wrote it. Oh, I, I know. I, I could tell just by that first chapter. I and I loved the conversational tone. I, I'm a big fan of, of 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 rock reads, and yours by far is the most anticipated one uh, on the docket. So, well, but but before we get too further along, because this is a great segue, uh, John's got Johnny John Zazula has a new book coming out called Heavy Tales: The Metal, The Music, The Madness, and. Uh, this is something if you are if you are any level of rock heavy metal fan you have to get this because this is the story of an important time in Amer especially american metal history i mean fr frankly at that time it was it was metal blade and megaforce that was it you two were the monsters out there and you know everything you guys were touching was basically like trend-setting music trend-setting bands it was again you know it was this it was this album i mean think it's about more, this it's more than kill them all yeah that's the purpose of the book too you know when you read the discography in the back yeah you really say like i said in my introduction he did that all it was about <laughs> four of us putting out nine albums sometimes in a year all classic records that have stood the test of time. Nine in a year. What were we on? <laughs> what were we doing? Did anybody sleep? Did anybody <laughs> home? Did, you know, back, back back then in that early time, Johnny, did you guys even? So you you came up. You know, the story is you and your you and your wife Marsha had the flea market, and you know you were selling music. Did you have any experience from the record label side when you started the label, or was this like, what the fuck am I doing? I knew nothing. Just... <laughs> I didn't have a clue, bro. <laughs> this was all by the seat of my pants. Everything was between me, God, and Marsha. I always say that. It was just that kind of world, you know, where... I would get my messages from above at 3.30. I wake up in the morning, talk to Marsha about it. And if it sounded good, we did it. If it didn't sound good, we did it. You know? <laughs> we just By the way, I, I loved how you threw your spirituality into that opening salvo in the book. I, I, I absolutely admired that. I loved how you were so passionate and so direct how, you know, it's one of those things you can almost not even put into words. I, I love the fact that you're going to be hearing this throughout the book. You know, I I uh, love the way you framed it. that. Uh oh, hold on. Okay. All right. Um, I wanted to give him credit. I want to give him Marsha credit where credit is due. You know, uh, as I say in the book a little later on. I felt like Noah, you know, <laughs> built, uh, an ark. I really did, and I'm not kidding, man. Yeah, yeah. that's I mean, what I mean. It's so it's so cool to to see it framed that way. 
I had to answer questions that were all round pegs and square holes. There was but, no answer written in any book. Just had to just do it. But one of the things I find compelling about your story that you kind of had touched on in the beginning is, is that if you liked them, you knew that people would like them. So right. obviously you went with your gut. And I, I think that's great. You weren't trying to sign the next Guns N' Roses or whoever it was that was popular. You were just trying to go, find really good bands to bring to the to the fans. I did this and almost destroyed myself with my loving of music and wanting people to appreciate what I appreciated. I started a classical label at Atlantic Records, Mega Forte. Nice. I put Spring City by Leonard Bernstein, Piano Virtual Show Apprentice. It was fantastic, but the, the synthesizers and everything we added were crap. It just didn't match the piano playing. He wasn't the electronic player. And then I went out to New Swirl at Polygram, which is a great album. Not metal, but revolutionary. Covered Warren Haynes. Without Warren Haynes plays with the Allman Brothers and he has Government Mule. Yeah. And I discovered the disco biscuits at the end. It's not metal. But they play four nights to 3,000 people a night in New York and Pennsylvania and Florida even. You know, that's the disco biscuits. So my ears have been right over and over again. Once in a while, I get nailed on the cross when people sacrifice T.T. Quick against my control. You know, <laughs> things like that. You know I, I've had some rough ones. T, 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 I was just going to bring up, T.T. Quick, in my opinion, is one of the most underrated hard rock metal albums out there. I remember when that came out, and I was in college radio, and I'm like, this whole album is brilliant. You know who did that album? Eddie Kramer did half, and Michael Wagner did half. Wow. So very, very well produced. Everything about it was great. The only problem was it came out during a regime change at Island. Oh. And the guy just came from Electra. He wanted me to put out more thrash, like anthrax kind of music. And what I had going at Atlantic, he wanted that over at Island. But I couldn't. But I already finished the TV Quick album and it was delivered. So there was no press. No retail exposure. Yep. No show marketing. It's the biggest radio album I ever put out. Next to Ace. It was a big shame. Horrible. Uh, huge, huge shame. I mean, that, that you know, if, if someone's looking for a, just a great, you know, undiscovered gem, go find that TT Quick album. It is so worth it. Great. I'm happy they got a plug. And the <laughs> EP before it. Yeah was unbelievable with Fortunate Son on it. it was, what a version of Fortunate Son. Great song, great rendition. I mean, you're, you're basically, your ears for rock and metal, um, they're, they were amazing back then. I mean, you were, you were finding so many bands that were just breaking ground, that that, you know, got their start with you and then moved on to other pastures where they got even bigger but well, if it wasn't for you a lot you know a lot of this stuff may never have happened well it was a revolution when it happened yeah you know it started with anvil and raven yep. and ben and you know metallica and it just kept going with merciful fate and man of war just it was a metal revolution and uh, i never wanted to stand <laughs> When did you start to see the tide shift? Negative? Yeah, like early 90s or at the end of the 80s? Nirvana goes number one. Did you know right then when that happened, you're like, uh-oh, we got a problem? No, we had a problem. I wasn't selling any records. But, I mean, did, it, was it, did it almost happen overnight in a way? Yes. It was like a black veil. Wow. 
Hey, Johnny, I, I actually wanted to go in the opposite direction. Going back when uh, Brian Slag was it Slago? Is that how you pronounce Slagle. it? Slago. Yeah. Slago. Like, how'd you hook up with him? Because that was obviously, I mean, he, see, back then I, I was really into the tape trading thing too. It was, it was a big deal. Now, did you just get into that generically with him or, you know, to. I didn't do nothing with Brian Slagle. Ever. I, I thought, isn't that how you got, I thought, isn't that how you were, became aware of, uh, of, of Metallica? Wasn't even on because of that ear collection. I didn't know he was on, they were on another record at the time. I found out quickly. Mm. You know, I thought I was getting it right off of No Life to a Ladder, fresh from the kitchen. Ah. Wow. So I never really spoke to Brian Slagle until I was retired. And well, I, 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 you know, I, because I know how, how big he was out on the West Coast as a trader. I, again, I, I'm finding this out for the first time, too. I was a destination for tapes. In other words, Everybody sent their tapes to me, no matter who it was, coroner, you name it, you know, everybody, basically, um, everybody, White Zombie, everybody, Pantera, everybody. And uh, I didn't have to go and trade. They wanted me to sell them in the store. So I listened to who was good, and I put it on the shelves for them, and they sent me a box of ten. When I sell them, I send them 50 bucks. And nice. that's how it was so simple. And I got to hear all the new music because that's all I did. Um, all spe you know, speaking of the Metallica thing, they come cross country for you. Um, yeah. What, I mean, how difficult was it when they had to let Dave Mustaine go? Or, I mean, were you in on that or? I knew it was going to happen, but I wasn't there. Okay. I'm, as I say in my interviews, I'm a coward. That was too much for my mirror. <laughs> Do you, and looking back now, any um, bands that you didn't get or feel at the time, but now you do and go, I wish I would have signed them opportunity-wise? Oh, I was too busy for Pantera. Okay. Oh. I'm ministry without Jorgensen when Rob Zombie wanted to play with me. And in those days, I took Rob Zombie, White Zombie, on tour with Anthrax. And Anthrax had on tour Al Jorgensen doing a bunch of ministry stuff with Scott Ian in the, in the set. Yeah. So uh, the answer is Pantera and White Zombie I turned down. Okay. Funny, the same people managed both bands who I turned them down to and became their biggest clients. You know? Yeah. Uh, I have no regrets. I would have liked to have signed Megadeth. But we just were too not trusting of each other, really, after the Metallica debacle. Yeah, that well, that makes sense, I suppose. You know? I just, I can't even imagine what it must have been like for you when you have all these bands sending you all this music and it's almost it almost seems like there's too many good ones to pick from. So how do you decide? The best. Also, I get on the phone with some of these bands and I talk to them. And if we clicked, I would say, hmm, I could work with these people. Because I really get into the heads of the band. You know, you got to get used to this guy going into the studio and telling you no. You know, I really got a lot of control. I was really into controlling the ship. Now, as far as the years go, the trunk was Ace Freely, March as Azula, King's X, Maria Ferrero brought me Testament and brought me Ministry. The others pretty much are me, you know. But I liked them. I liked all these bands very much. It took a little persuasion make me sign them but once i did i felt very comfortable in my skin about it johnny did you keep all of the original tapes these bands sent you do you still have them great question i lived in a huge house in new hope pennsylvania bucks county and i was moving from ten thousand square feet to four 
size of a house. I had a vault with all the tapes beautifully labeled and everything in it. I called all the bands four months before I moved, and I said, if you want them, here they are, your masters, just come and get them. Only T.T. Quick came, and nobody else came. Metallica, I returned to Metallica, but Anthrax, Merciful say, you name it, man. I took all these tapes. I had a big bin outside from throwing out all my shit in my house. It took me three people to dump that studio full of tapes. Oh. So somewhere in a dumpster is all the masters of Megaforce Records in a garbage heap. Oh. oh, my God. A treasure hunt for somebody now. If somebody asked me uh, for the tape now, I can't do anything about it. But I gave him four months. I just can't carry that all around. I didn't carry my album collection either. I sold my albums, my 7,000 albums. I sold them. You know, I kept one of everything, metal, if not two, some. You know, I have about 10 long rages. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how about the original, like, cassette tape demos that you would have been sent. Do you still have any of those original cassette tapes? Oh, I've been picked clean over the years because I didn't want to carry it all with me. I, at one point, they had a major museum with the Master of Puppets original art and a bunch of other things, you know. And uh, somebody came to me who buys for hard rock and whatever, and he was offering top dollar for things, and I was putting in a pool of and I just had to thin out my collection. I lost quite a few crazy things when he came. Wow. Wow, the amount of history there. The oh, yeah. History. Things you wouldn't imagine. I sold the quill pen that Manowar dipped in blood <laughs> to sign the contracts. Oh. They signed the contracts to Megaforce in blood. I still have the contracts with their DNA here in the house. That's funny. Hey, going on to another artist, uh, how come King's X didn't hit, do you think? Too different a sound for the world to adjust to. Too different a sound. Um, the world's ears weren't ready. Only musicians got it. And people who really love music got it. But if you just wanted to thrash and bang and do the Megaforce thing, You'd look at King's X and go, what's Johnny signing in now? What the fuck is this now? You know, you can't depend on Megaforce anymore. This ain't thrash. Yeah, we sold 200,000. And we had a number two single in the country. We my my younger brother actually turned me on to that. And I was fortunate. They were, because obviously, you know, this is a, a KISS podcast. And, and KISS does the KISS cruise every year. And um you know, I've seen King's X a bunch of times, but, you know, they played, I don't know if it was last year, the year before on the Kiss Cruise. And, and the whole time I'm sitting there watching him going, how did these guys just not get huge? Uh, just enough to make a living. They make good money every night playing four or five nights. Yeah, but I, but I always thought, as you know, the, the Gretchen record, I was just so surprised it didn't, you know. Great albums. Listen, they're the greatest albums, those albums on Megaforce. Fantastic album. You know, there's clouds in the sky and they spell out different things for different people and destiny. You know, uh, you know the bands I've worked with. There are certain bands that everything goes wrong all the time. The trucks always break down at the most critical shows. The amps blow out. The guitar strings go in the middle of a solo. Things happen. And bands don't make it because of them. If they happen too much. Right. And I feel some bands carry dark clouds with them. I won't name them because it's not fair. But you know. Were you surprised that. Um, uh, what, what's the record after Among the Living? Uh, da, da, da. This is fun. No, no, no. The one before that. Oh, spreading the disease. My no, that's no, 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 no. The one but the yellow cover one. No, oh, euphoria. State of euphoria. That's five. That's the fourth or fifth. Yeah, well, that's that's after that's the next one directly after Among the Living, correct? I think so. But my my point is, I was just surprised because that 
they really push that and and it I always thought that record should be bigger for some reason because Among the Living really did well. I will say something to you. All the records went gold. Everything went gold. And uh, I'm a man sold like tonnage. Yes. And the Pack of the Killer Bees, I think, was the platinum. You know, so... You know, it's like the song Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, you know? Yeah. They did very well in their life, and now they're living the dream. Anthrax, you know, they're living the dream. They're making more money now than they ever dreamed they would make. You know, so another one right for the Z. I managed that band eleven years, by the way. Well, I, I know how close you were with them. I was very close. How I, now? When when Neil left, was that a big surprise? Because I read I read Scott's book and. He didn't really even seem to give a shit that, I mean, he didn't. Nobody cared. I just thought that was odd. And I'm, I'm the same with you. They're just, that first record is the shit. I love that. Don't get me wrong. I love all the Joey stuff too. I'm, I'm a big Anthrax fan, but that, I remember getting that new fistful of metal and I was just blown away. Um, that, that record is still a classic, a metal classic. I absolutely love it. It surprised me. I thought they came together in the studio Tremendously, and like when I heard Metal Thrashing Mad for the first time, oh yeah, I was so impressed. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I know what it sounded like, John, Johnny. In in the in the mid to late eighties, was were you getting band hair metal bands pitched to you to sign? Were you getting pushed to go in that direction? Poison. I could have bought the first Poison album for ten thousand dollars. <sighs> Wow. Didn't want it. You weren't Smart a fan. Me. I mean, you, you weren't a fan of it. And, 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 and that, that's what's real about this, I guess, is, you know, you're, you're a fan, so you're releasing what you're a fan of. That doesn't mean somebody else isn't going to release something and it's going to be great. You just weren't a fan of it. That's exactly correct. That's exactly correct. Did, did, a- did, did Atlantic try to pressure you though of like hey we see all this commercial metal is is going you need to sign more of that johnny i think we're very intelligent the only band they really gave me a hard time about was violence but they were with me on everything they were with me on everything atlantic uh no direction anything they told me when they felt i made mistakes uh the president of atlantic doug morris did call me in the office and gave said Johnny, I'll give you a two million dollar budget if you could go get Nine Inch Nails on Atlantic. But I couldn't compete with Interscope. You know, I just couldn't compete. But I had two million dollars in my hand to give Nine Inch Nails at one point. Wow. Wow. Well, so very. They couldn't understand why I couldn't sign them. Why I had to go to Interscope. What 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 was the issue with violence? The album was a little too brutal for, uh, and the lyrics were really. Violent. Yeah, I love that. Right, that debut record's really cool. I got that one. And Atlantic just didn't want to know. Atlantic didn't want to know, and they asked me politely. You know, I ended up putting it out on Caroline. Okay. I had and a distributor I had problems and I kept my non-big albums over there okay so Johnny we've been on for geez, pretty much an hour now time, hey, that's cool. time flies when you're having great conversation I want to make sure I give you an opportunity to, to, to plug your book one more time Heavy Tales, The Metal, The Music, The Madness by John Zazula When's it coming out? October 29th. It ships October 22nd. And it's not available at stores. It's only available online at Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and at JohnZazula.com. <laughs> there nice. you go. There you go. This you got to get, again, I've said it before, you've got to get this this book. Because if you have any interest in music history, metal history, hard rock history. This is 
a huge part of history. I mean, as as I was thinking about this interview earlier today, I'm like, you know, there was always the new wave of British heavy metal. There's no denying how impactful that was. Could you be considered the new wave of American heavy metal? Yeah. Fuck yeah. Yeah. Well, what you were doing was no different, in a way, what Neil Kay was doing with the Soundhouse, if you know the, I know you know the, right, right. you know, but it could, but that's what you were doing. You were giving a voice to these bands that didn't have a voice. And, you know, and because of you amplifying their music, uh, the world is a better place. You know, as Marsha and I say, we created the soundtrack of your youth. You sure you did. saved the 80s for me, I, sure I tell did. you what. I, I certainly went in that direction. I and I purposefully bought records just because they were on Megaforce. I'm like, <laughs> I was just gonna say that, Mark. I was gonna say Megaforce got to the point where, if there was a new album coming out in Megaforce, I would just check it out because Megaforce is putting it out because you've had such a history of great music. It's a pretty good chance this is gonna be great. I had well, a- I, I, like the on the man stuff. I remember when that was just actually the B side. You know what I mean? And the next thing you know, the, the tape traders and the people who bought the singles, it it took off. It, it got you know because Johnny, that had to have been like just a throwaway or something funny that they did in the studio. Exactly, that is exactly correct. I, I remember the, tour, the I saw the Among the Living tour here in Detroit. Metal Church opened. And I remember joking with my friend who I was there with, and I'm like, I wonder if they're going to play I'm the Man, because it just, it was a B-side on a single. And sure as fuck, they did. It and the place it. went absolutely batshit crazy. It was so much fun. Yep. 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 I can't take any credit for that. <laughs> Hey, what did you think, Johnny? Because because you, you you play a big part in the uh, they're friggin' in the riggin' cover. The bottom line is the I, I'm sure that had to make you smile. That that I still think that's pretty freaking uh, brilliant I, of them. But I wrote the words to Medusa and the melody line. Really? Yeah, it's my song. So uh, you know, I had a little fun with Anthrax in my life. I got to play with the lighting designs, everything, the stage sets. It really gave me an opportunity to have a lot of fun. You know, that's great to hear. Seven that's years cool. of fun. You know, and when we parted, we had to part. It was just enough of each other. <laughs> Fair, that's a really nice way to say it. Too much, too much for me and too much for them. We just, that was it, you know. So listen, I'm gonna bid you guys a farewell. Thank, thank you, thank Johnny. You. This was you, this was a true honor and a pleasure. Um, you. You've imparted us with some minutia that we never knew about. And best of luck with Heavy Tales. Everybody, go out pre-order it right now. I've got mine pre-ordered on Amazon.com. All right. Yeah. Thanks, John. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Sign me out. Take care. So. Yeah, I think this constitutes a fanboy episode. I think oh. I even went a little fanboyish too. Well, I, the one part th- there towards the end, though, Michael, so true. I remember flipping through my fanzines. I'm like, okay, there's a new Megaforce. Yep. Okay, got yep. just gotta go buy it because I know it'll be heavy. I know it'll be cool. You know what I mean? It, it was they they built such a quote brand on that Megaforce Records name that you just knew. It was going to be something good. You well, trust. You had trust in Johnny Z because he had the years. I I, re- I really was their target audience because I I wanted nothing to do with the hair metal. I I, I, I wanted to rock. Damn it! And I thought maybe it's because some of the albums came with like I don't know a coupon for crab. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did enough of this that this past weekend. Let me tell you, it was a good weekend in Florida for the Chikinis. We, you, uh, you, you know, it, tried it, three new restaurants. It's kind, it's kind of, it's funny though, Mark, because you were like, Megaforce was everything you wanted because you hated all the other music that was happening at the time. Except, I was the opposite. I loved all the stuff that was happening at the time, and I still loved Megaforce because. Sometimes it's like, yeah, you know, I just needed that overkill record because I was 
had too much of Bon Jovi. We don't care what you want. Fuck you you know, know, Man of War, Overkill, Exciter. I mean, it's just like oh, you sorry. you knew. And, and again, I keep going back to it, but you know, I I went out and picked up the first Metallica album through Megaforce. I again, I, I had the No Life to Leather cassette. I was I was so. I remember driving because I graduated in 83 and I remember driving to parties with some of my friends going, you got to check this shit out. And they're like, and at the time that was the heaviest of the heaviest because I was again, too, I was one of those, I, I got into motorhead early. I, and I'm like, this stuff makes motorhead sound tame. You know what I mean? Yep. And, and it's, and it's like, my friends were just all fucking freaking out. It, about... it was literally a revolution of new music, at least for American ears. Dude, I, I remember stopping the car when, like, I'm like, I pushed the cassette in, and, and if you remember how hit the light starts, <clears throat> my friends are like, "What the fuck is that?" I'm like, "Dude, check it." You know, it was just it was, that just brings back such great fucking party times. When, when Friday, that record was gas new. And sip, no women around. Oh, dude, just <laughs> let me tell you, nothing like rocking with your brothers, man. Just those. Well, were yeah, yeah. Put putting that Metallica out. tape in isn't going to bring the chicks in. That's for sure. <laughs> no, I <laughs> care. Those are those are some <laughs> drinking beer, having fun, man. That was the best fucking time, man. Just because he was there by choice. <laughs> <laughs> Look, all that stuff, all that stuff, just meant the world to me. You know. Uh, just fi- especially back at then, finding new bands, and it's funny how they all kind of piggybacked after one, after one another. I remember when the first Metal Church album came out, and it was really like. And then I remember they got signed to um, uh, Electra after Electra. that. They were at label mates because I, I love the first record. If you, I tell you what, if you've never heard the first Metal Church record, just go to that that the title track. You know that they're. they're that song Metal Church is just it's like the perfect metal song. And it was just crazy because when the Dark came out, which did quite well for them, but the production values were over the top. I mean, don't get me wrong, still fucking great. But that first record, it's kinda like if you compare the early Metallica stuff to the black record. It just doesn't It's like comparing you know, the, the Kiss debut album to Crazy Nights. Yeah, really. It, it, it's really. It, it, but Michael, you're absolutely right. Yeah, no. That, uh, you know, that really is. There, the, there, the, there the, is something to be said for bands' first album or albums that were released through self-releasing or independent labels, where they didn't have the budget to go in and spend two million dollars in a studio and get the perfect sound. It's like, yeah, we got to record this over the weekend. So we're recording ten songs tonight. You know, there's there's some rawness. There's some some urgency. Uh, is urgency. A good word. Some some something authentic about it when it's yes. when it's done that way. Yeah. So yeah, right. you know, again, me, you know, and and at the time Megaforce was out, I was uh, I was involved in college radio, and I had a metal show, and it was just like you know, Megaforce was just the shit metal metal blade was a little bit too thrashy for me i was i i totally dug some stuff on it but megaforce was a little bit more in my wheelhouse because it wasn't all just screaming well isn't the first metal church on is that a metal blade i don't know i don't know either I don't think it's on combat. No, it's not on combat. Here's a little, so combat, here's a, here's, combat was another uh, cool label. Com, combat was a good one. Yep. Enigma. Enigma, definitely. Enigma was a little, Again, a little more I, commercial, but Enigma had some good stuff. Um, I, I have an issue of Kickass Monthly where my old band is on one page and the next page Poison was on it, and it, we were both doing the same thing at the time. We we're putting our putting our demos out there to Wearing get review. No, not at all. No, <laughs> certainly not my thing. So. Here, here's, a, here's, with, a, here's a little Metal Blade trivia. Black and Blue's first appearance on a release was on a Metal Blade compilation album. Hmm. 
kind of interesting when you think about the where me, where black and blue went sound wise and what metal blade was going to but that was the very first appearance of a black and blue track on a on a release i did not know that wow we stumped the trunk <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right. Hey, hold, uh, hold. Before, before we run and everything, I do want to say thank you to John and Paul from Simmons Cola or whatever it's called. Gene Simmons Cola. Let me tell you, I'm not just saying this. This is really good pop. That's what we say it, here in the Rock and Roll City. It reminds it me is, of like the 70s. Yes. 70s and just pop we had because it was it's pure cane sugar versus the high fructose. Now, also, too, just drinking it out of a bottle, it just tastes so much better than out of a can. You know, let me tell you, if you guys get this stuff, and again, guys, this is purely being as honest as possible. It's not shilling. That stuff's dynamite. I'm, I'm drinking the diet one right now. My kids love the, the cream soda. And it, it, it look. We're not shilling. It's really that, like Tommy said, it really is. If you like to drink pop, this is good stuff. So, matter of fact, we are going to have. I don't know if we're going to have them both on, or I know we've got to work out who's coming on, but we're going to have them on to talk about it. Yeah, but let me tell. I, I just to get, let you guys know though, I met them when I was in Buffalo and we had breakfast together, and I didn't think any. They just wanted to meet because they like the show. Uh, the the brothers watch that, you eat. Yeah, <laughs> let me tell you what wonderful, genuine people and. Uh, I even said to my wife, I'm like, oh, I'll try the pop. I, I just didn't think it was going to be all that. And boy, were we surprised. Um, fantastic. So, uh, like I said, Gene Simmons soda is really good. So uh, if it's if you see it in the market, uh, you guys are not going to be disappointed. And again, you know what? I, if if we, I wouldn't have liked it, I wouldn't be drinking and I wouldn't be talking about it because I'm one of those kind of people. I'm not going <laughs> to look, 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 when we were really honest about a book, couple of years ago we certainly got the fucking shit about that exactly you, you weren't afraid <laughs> so, to say what you thought back then <laughs> no and, and it really you know it's no different than with anything else and and like as i said at the beginning of this episode when when we got the first pdf of john's first chapter and when i ripped through that reading and i was like god damn it i can't wait for the rest i the, yep. this, 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 the, the conversational, I'm, I think you and I traded a couple of emails about that. I'm like, how cool that first fucking chapter was and how fascinating a story is. Remember that? Like, can we get him on? Can we get him on? And uh, yeah, as yeah. you can tell by my excitement, it certainly was uh, one that I was looking forward to. So so let's let's throw some homework out there for this week. Um, do you have a favorite Megaforce Records release? It doesn't have to be Ace Fraley related. You know, it's not. It's called it, Ride the Lightning, which is one of the greatest albums ever made, with probably the greatest metal song of all time called Creeping Death. It gets no better. That is, to me, metal perfection. I, I, I got to say, I and I mentioned it in the show, I think that T.T. Quick album is... It's, it's actually really, really I think it's, it's, that, it's really, really good. good. You know, it's not, it's not thrash. It's not speed. Good. Uh, it's good. just really good metal i mean if you like acdc type stuff judas priest type stuff um tt quick is great and 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 Mike, that, that, was, that features Bucket? mark mark who is now the lead singer and accept michael were you ever a rhino bucket fan um a little bit I, i've got a couple of their albums very yeah, acdc yeah, yeah, I was going to say when you were talking about it, but that was a band that went, you know what, we're just going to listen to nothing but ACDC and write a record. Yep, Don't exactly. honor, I really love Ride the Rhino, if you want to check that that tune out, that's a fucking great they're, they're, They were like, sort of like um, Airborne from a couple decades earlier. Yes, that's absolutely <laughs> true. My band actually opened for Airborne. They were really I mean, nothing nice wrong with them. Airborne. I've seen them, and they, 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 they freaking rock, and they're incredible live. I don't even know mm -hmm. if they're still around, but, you know... They are. They just released. Uh, I got the new issue of Classic Rock, and they're they're, they're clearly they're, a band that you know sits around and listens to ACDC. Um, but yeah, good. so homework. What what's your favorite Megaforce Records release, and why? What about it? Is is what do you love about it? Also, was Amit right? Oh Did you see Ace on that tour? Yeah. That, yeah. To here, me, anybody who went did. Anybody that's listening or watching, go to see Ace Fraley at Madison Square Garden open for Iron Maiden. 
we would love you to leave a comment about what you remember about Ace's performance. Because that little tidbit from Johnny about the conversation backstage, that's... That was big. That's the kiss of death that's, right that, there. That's, that, yeah, that's basically the label being very polite and saying we're no longer going to push this artist. You can do whatever you want, but don't count on us to get excited. Look, I saw Ace on that tour, and he's absolutely right. That was not an exciting band. Sorry, it just wasn't. I, again, you know, I, I, when I was first aware, made aware of Ace's solo stuff just coming back in general... I, the first thing I got were some demos with Richie, and the first photos I saw were with him. And I remember when the Comet record came out, I'm like, I, was, I don't know, I was very underwhelmed. But I do like the record. I think the first Ace Frehley record is, is good. I, 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 again, I good. stand by, I love I love his 87 Frehley's Comet album. It's good. Every, good e- e- everything it's good. after that, especially Second Sighting and Live Plus One, sort of was like lost in a fog, lost in a haze. There was no direction. You could just tell something wasn't wasn't going on behind the scenes that was favorable to Ace. So leave your homework, facebook.com, three si- slash three sides of the coin, Instagram, Twitter. We are everywhere on YouTube as well. And, of course, subscribe on YouTube. And leave us a review and rating on iTunes. It means a lot to us. And uh, that's it. Let me check the calendar. I think we've got a guest next week. We have... Oh, next week is the Gene Simmons Cola guest. So guests coming up. we got a lot of cool guests coming up. Um, That's it. We'll see everybody next week. So you love the show. Go to iTunes.3SidesOfTheCoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. Download your free free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on noise trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. So you love the show. Go to iTunes.3SidesOfTheCoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.